My name is Erin Laurie and I'm the Executive Director for the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation. I uh, hope all of you can hear me okay and see me okay. It's uh, always a little strange presenting to a computer screen rather than a room full of people. Um, but uh, yeah, should be exciting today. We have uh, a great webinar planned for you. And uh, hopefully you're able to join us for some of the last webinars that we had in our series. Um, we've been running all summer. And uh, so this is the last installment that we have. And uh, last week we had Hannah talk about uh, water levels and coastal processes on Lake Huron. And uh, this week we're going to be talking about coastal restoration on uh, beaches, dunes, and in our coastal forest. Now, um, there should be on your screen uh, a box that uh, says Q&A. So if you do have any questions that come up throughout the presentation, you can always uh, type them in there. And uh, hopefully I'll have some time to answer some of your questions at the end. So first, uh, just in case you're new to the webinar series or uh, new to our organization, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what the Coastal Center is and what we do. Uh, so we were founded in 1998 and uh, we had the goal of protecting and restoring Lake Huron's coastal environment and promoting a healthy coastal ecosystem. We are a non-government, uh, non-profit charitable organization. We are a, a registered charity and uh, we run a number of different programs. We do things like beach cleanups, we do shoreline restoration projects, we do lots of community outreach and education workshops, things like that. And uh, we have a brand new youth program this year, which is really exciting, the uh, Coastal Conservation Youth Corps program. So if you'd like to learn more about um, any of our programs, you can always visit our website, which is lakehuron.ca, really easy to remember. And uh, we do run all of these programs and uh, they, they really wouldn't be possible without the support and uh, donations from people like you. So thank you for all of your support. And uh, I would just like to say thank you as well to our uh, very generous sponsors with their contributions. They were, we were able to bring you this entire webinar series uh, completely free of charge. So thank you to um, Bruce Power and uh, the TD Friends of the Environment Foundation and the Nuclear Waste Management Organization for uh, funding both our Coast Watchers program, our Green Ribbon Champion program, and uh, for making this webinar series possible this summer. So that's uh, fantastic. So let's get into it, ecological restoration. So what does that really mean? Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's defined as the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that's been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. And uh, there are a lot of different terms that are kind of thrown around when we're talking about restoring ecosystems. So it can get a little bit confusing. So I've put a few different definitions here on uh, the slides and uh, I don't expect you to, to you know, memorize all of them or anything like that. Um, but it is important to know that there is a difference. So restoration is a very intentional activity that um, you're working to initiate or accelerate ecosystem recovery and you're looking at things like species composition, ecological function, connectivity to the surrounding landscape and uh, neighboring ecosystems. And uh, so that's uh, basically you're working on returning the ecosystem to how it would have been, how nature intended it to be if uh, there hadn't been damage to it. And uh, remediation is another term you might hear a lot, and that's a little bit different. So that's um, improving or ex an existing ecosystem or creating a brand new one with the aims of replacing one that's been deteriorated or destroyed. So it doesn't mean that you're returning the ecosystem to the way that nature intended. You're just replacing it maybe with something else. So this could be an example of um, uh, coastal forests that uh, had been cleared for agriculture and then maybe you're working on restoring it to be a, a meadow ecosystem. So it's still good, but it's not um, restoration necessarily. And then uh, the term mitigation means uh, legally mandated remediation. 
And uh, that's usually done to um, when there is uh, loss of protected species or ecosystems involved. And then there's uh, reclamation, which is a little bit different. So this is uh, converting land that might be perceived as being useless to a more productive condition. So this might be uh, for agriculture and uh, recovery of productivity is the main goal here. And uh, then there's also habitat enhancement. So this is often used uh, if you're looking, say, at an endangered uh, species of wildlife, for example, and maybe you're working on improving that specific habitat for that particular species. So an ecological restoration project begins with a vision of how your impaired ecosystem Hi everyone, I, I'm hoping you can still hear me. I did get kicked off for having some technical difficulties. Just trying to see if I can get my screen going again here. So it's definitely why I prefer standing in front of an audience and uh, presenting rather than talking to my computer by myself. <laughs> Just gonna give it a minute here to try to get it working again. Okay, I think we're back up and running again. I apologize for any confusion. Hopefully everyone is still there and didn't get kicked off. It looks like we're, we're working again. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was talking about uh, the first step in your ecological restoration project. And uh, this is uh, starting off with something called a reference model. So ideally you would find a nearby healthy ecosystem to use as an example as a goal for your project. So this could be a neighboring property. Uh, you might want to look at um, a local provincial park and what their ecosystems look like. Or um, you could even use a historical photo of your property to use as a reference. Uh, so without a reference model, it can be really difficult to find a direction for your project. So um, when you are selecting a reference model, things you want to look for are uh, specific ecological attributes of a fully functioning, healthy, restored ecosystem. And uh, you're going to want to look for these attributes both before, um, during, and after your project to help you assess whether your restoration work is successful or whether you need to make some adjustments to your project. Things that you're, that you're looking at to assess the ecological attributes of your ecosystem. Uh, the first thing you want to look at is the uh, types of vegetation and wildlife on the property. So your species composition. A healthy restored ecosystem should have a full complement of lots of different types of species. Uh, so this is referred to as species richness. And properties that have a wider diversity of species are much more resilient to disturbance and disease. And it's important to assess whether the vegetation on your site is native or invasive as well, and how many different types of these plants are found. It's really important that you're only using native species during your restoration work and not any ornamental plants or any invasive species. And if you want to learn more about invasive species and why this matters, we did do a webinar on this topic a few weeks ago and you can find uh, the recording on our website, which is lakehuron.ca. The next thing you wanna look at, um, the ecological attributes of your restored ecosystem, you wanna look at the external threats and stressors that the ecosystem may be facing and then the resilience of the ecosystem. So this means the ability of your ecosystem to recover from any damage caused by stress and disturbance. 
And uh, so this is much more difficult to assess, of course, but uh, we do go into a lot of detail on the threats and stressors for different types of coastal ecosystems in our uh, new coastal action plan. So you can find this plan and uh, different fact sheets on all of the different ecosystem types on our website if you'd like to learn more about this. And uh, of course, I could go much further into the subject overall. There are entire courses and uh, post-secondary programs on this subject, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have time today. So timing, timing is everything. And uh, restoration work often takes many years to complete. So it's really important to create a long-term plan for your project. Things that you wanna consider in your plan would be whether there are any wildlife using the area and when they're using the area, that's really important. Uh, if you're doing a beach restoration, you would want to be aware of the timing for um, shorebirds nesting, for example. And uh, if you're identifying any invasive species on your property that need removing, you'll also need to do some research to consider the best timing for the removal of these species. So for example, when you're removing Phragmites, it's best to do this before the seeds have matured uh, in midsummer. And the same goes for planting native species, of course. You'll want to look at the different uh, types of plants that you want to include in your project and the best timing to ensure the highest survival rate of these plants. If you're going to go to all this trouble, you want to make sure they have the best chance of survival. So for example, when you're planting dune grass, this is best done once uh, the nights become cooler later in the fall. And uh, you'll also want to include a time frame for monitoring after you've completed your restoration work. Do you want to keep an eye on um, any invasive species returning, uh, the survival rate of your plantings? And uh, it's also really great to uh, notice whether you're seeing any wildlife returning to the area. And one more important thing that you need to consider when you're planning any restoration work is whether you would need any permits to complete this work. And uh, these permits might be required depending on the type of equipment that you're, you're using. Uh, if, if there are any species at risk using the property um, or any plants on the property. And uh, if you're planning to use any herbicides, of course. So a good place to start is by contacting um, your local conservation authority and uh, they can hopefully provide you with some more information on any uh, permitting that you might need for your project. So all of this sounds like a lot of work, so why, why bother? <laughs> well, restoring coastal ecosystems not only benefits you as a property owner, but it benefits everyone who lives, works, and plays in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, restoration work helps to protect our water quality and as we know Lake Huron provides clean drinking water for millions of people so this is really important. Uh, it helps to create habitat for rare species that can't be found anywhere else and that rely on our coastal ecosystems to survive. And uh, if you live along the shoreline, your properties become more resilient to water level changes, which uh, we're experiencing right now, and uh, erosion issues, climate change. And this can save you a lot of money over the long term. So it really benefits everyone to put a little bit of effort into restoring our coastal ecosystems. First, I'd like to talk about our uh, coastal forests, since uh, most of us can easily play a part in restoring our coastal forests, even if we don't live right along the shoreline. Now, the forests that we have in the Lake Huron Basin, they're remnants of what used to be large forests pre-European uh, settlement, which covered around 90% of our landscape in southwestern Ontario. Now today, our coastal forests and woodlands in this area have become mostly reduced to small patches or fragments. And this issue of fragmentation is a really important one when we're talking about the Lake Huron shoreline. Since our Lake Huron corridor is uh, such an important corridor for wildlife, like migratory birds, for example. And uh, when forest patches become isolated, it makes it more difficult for plants and animals to move around. So this ends up restricting breeding and gene flow, and this can result in long-term population declines for both plants and wildlife. So by enhancing any forest patches on your property and being mindful of this, you can help to improve the overall connectivity of our Huron fringe.
So why do coastal forests matter? Well, there are quite a lot of benefits of having more forest cover. Uh, strategic tree planting can help to save uh, 25 to 50% in your energy bills annually. So they do this uh, by providing passive cooling technology uh, in the summertime and helping to shelter our structures in the winter. Uh, you can think about things like planting uh, leafy deciduous trees on the south and east sides of your property to help provide more shade in the in the summertime. And uh, when the leaves fall off in the winter, you'll get more of that sunshine coming in to help uh, warm your house in the winter. And uh, then you can also think about planting coniferous trees like spruces on the north um, and west sides of your house. And uh, this will help to slow down wind and help to protect your house from winter storms. So that can help with your energy bills in the winter time as well. And uh, of course, having more forest cover, more trees, if you're living in a cottage, um, will help to protect your cottage from any storms that are coming in. And uh, Trees actually help to purify and uh, absorb water. So one tree actually will drink uh, over 200 liters of water each year. And this is really important if you're living on a bluff or near a gully um, because the trees help to remove a lot of the moisture from the soil and uh, their roots help to stabilize those slopes. They're really important to have on those uh, types of shorelines. And uh, trees also help to fight climate change, of course, by um, absorbing quite a bit of uh, CO2 each year. And uh, one of the, the best parts too is they just make our properties more beautiful. Mature trees actually help to improve uh, real estate values. They found a study in the USA showed that uh, mature trees could actually improve your property value by over $100,000. So the first target for, uh, for helping to restore our coastal forests would be to increase the percent forest cover. So Environment and Climate Change Canada created a document called How Much Habitat is Enough? And this document set parameters to help determine how much forest cover is needed to make sure our forests have high ecological integrity. There are of course many other aspects that you want to look at when you're assessing ecological integrity of a forest, but this is a good basic one to start looking at. And uh, anything less than 30% is defined as being high risk. So if you have less than 30% forest cover, it means that the ecosystem won't likely be able to support even half of the potential species that it could, and it puts our aquatic ecosystems in Lake Huron at risk. So the goal is to have at least 50% forest cover to help support a healthy watershed. But uh, unfortunately, most of our coastal forests in southwestern Ontario do not meet this minimum of 50%. So we encourage people to help uh, contribute to this forest cover and you can do that very easily by simply uh, planting native tree species wherever you can on your own property. Uh, you could participate in a public tree planting event um, or by simply encouraging your municipality to plant more trees in public spaces and to use uh, native species rather than ornamental species for street trees. I did mention uh, invasive species. Um, so the introduction of invasive species into forest ecosystems, it can occur through recreation, through uh, transportation corridors, so seeds moving in on vehicle tires, for example, or just a natural movement of species, um, maybe through wildlife dispersal or something like that. And uh, introduced uh, plant and animal species can alter natural functions in forests by um, lowering the canopy cover, destroying the understory, or preventing natural regeneration. And forests in particular have a difficulty defending themselves against invasive species because they may have no natural resistance to these invaders, um, or obviously they're unable to relocate. And uh, as a result, this can lead to very high tree mortality. Uh, some examples of invasive species that you might find in a coastal forest would be um, Asian longhorn beetle, uh, emerald ash borer, these are invasive insects, 
And a lot of our coastal forests are, um, are being affected by invasive plants in the understory, um, like English ivy, uh, periwinkle, those are probably the two that I see the most. And uh, we sometimes see garlic mustard as well. And a lot of these plants are what we would call garden escapees. So a lot of people do have these in their gardens and uh, they very easily spread from gardens off into wild areas. So if you do have any of these plants in your garden, it would be really great if you could work at uh, removing them and trying to plant uh, native ground cover species instead. Um, some substitutions that you can use uh, would be wild geranium, uh, wild strawberry or bearberry. They're very nice, uh, much less invasive ground covers that you can use instead. And uh, this is really important because um, if you, you do learn to identify things like English ivy and periwinkle and you're out for a walk in the forest, um, you'll notice it has become very common and it tends to, to take over the understory in the forest and just wreak havoc on that uh, forest ecosystem, leaving then less food and shelter available for our wildlife. Now I know trees can be very expensive, um, but there are a lot of great programs out there that uh, you might not be aware of that can help with this. There are a lot of uh, free tree programs out there, even if you just do a little bit of research. And uh, I found that most of the conservation authorities have really great uh, seedling programs. So you can um, find out which conservation authority area you live in and get in touch with them to find out if they have um, any type of tree planting programs or seedling programs where you can um, order seeds at a much lower cost um, or order small trees at a much lower cost than you would uh, have to pay at a nursery. And uh, there are also heritage plantings. There's the 50 million tree program, um, the Pine River Watershed Initiative Network. They've um, done planting programs as well if you live in that area. And uh, it's important if uh, you can to try to work with your neighbors to help to keep these habitats unfragmented and uh, give our trees some room to grow. And uh, yeah, so this is a very easy way that you can help to protect our coastal ecosystems. Uh, even though I live in town, I don't live on the lakeshore myself, but I do live within two kilometers of the shoreline. So I'm still within that Huron fringe area. So I've made an effort to plant uh, quite a few different native tree species on my own property. I chose um, to plant sugar maples and white spruce trees on my property. Uh, I did try a tamarack as well, but uh, that one didn't survive. So I'll have to do a little bit more experimenting to uh, see if it was just that particular tree or if, um, if the tamaracks might just not do very well on my property in general. But uh, yeah, it can be fun to, uh, to play around with it and, and experiment and see what you can get to grow on your property. Uh, so I mentioned that um, I was trying tamaracks and white spruce and uh, sugar maple, but a few other trees that you could consider uh, would be eastern white cedar, um, some aspen species, uh, ash species, um, though these ones are um, currently being impacted by the emerald ash borer, of course, and uh, white birch we often find in our coastal forests as well. And they're a great, um, kind of call them a pioneer species or a good one to start with. They grow quickly and they uh, like the sunshine, so they um, might be good to start with. And uh, just important to note that we don't want to be planting Norway maples. Sometimes people mistakenly call these a red maple. They do have a red leaf um, color, but uh, we don't want to be planting Norway maples because they're a non-native species. We want to aim for uh, sugar maples and red maples in particular. And uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, native trees can be trickier to find if you're shopping at uh, nurseries, but uh, there are quite a few native plant nurseries if you're uh, willing to look around and uh, again, check if your local conservation authority has any seedling programs available. And if you'd like more information on uh, the different types of native plants that you can uh, look at growing and, uh, and you wanna learn more about this, you can visit our website. We do have a native plant guide available on there for free. And uh, there's also another guide that talks about what uh, plants do best on coastal bluffs in particular. So if you're living maybe in the Bayfield area and you wanna learn about uh, what plants to grow in your bluff ecosystem, you can look at that. 
And uh, if you're interested in learning about uh, what kinds of plants you can use in your gardens um, to replace common invasive species, like I had mentioned, uh, replacing periwinkle or English ivy, um, another resource that we would really highly recommend is called uh, Grow Me Instead. And you can find this by a uh, quick Google search. If you Google Grow Me Instead, um, it's on the Ontario Invasive Plant Council's website. And uh, yeah, so of course there's a lot more that I could go on and on about when talking about uh, forest restoration, but uh, we're going to have to move on, unfortunately. And I'd like to talk now about uh, working on restoration on our sand beaches and dune ecosystems on Lake Huron. So Lake Huron sand dunes are one of the most rare and fragile ecosystems in Canada. And these sandy beach ecosystems make up only actually about 2% of the entire Lake Huron shoreline, which uh, might be surprising to people because I know when you think of Lake Huron, often your mind jumps to the sandy beaches, but uh, yeah, it's only actually 2% of the entire shore. And this small 2% is a really highly valued place by millions of residents and uh, seasonal visitors every year. So really important and, and very fragile. Why do dunes matter? Why are we even talking about this? Well, sand dunes provide us humans with a lot of benefits. And the first would be um, protecting your property and protecting the shore from storms. So they act kind of like uh, mangroves do in the ocean. They act as a buffer and help to uh, slow down any storms before they come in and, and reach your property. And they help to slow down big waves and uh, could even prevent help to prevent flooding on your property. And uh, dunes also help to improve uh, the quality of our beach sand, so helping to improve uh, tourism over the long run. We have nice, uh, good quality beaches then for people to visit. And uh, dunes help to filter and keep our drinking water clean, filtering out any contaminants that are maybe running off the land towards the water. Those uh, dune plants help to filter out all of that stuff and protect our, our drinking water quality. And dunes provide habitat for really rare plants and, and a lot of neat wildlife that uh, can't really be found other places. And uh, studies have actually shown that healthy, mature dunes can increase property values, which is kind of neat. I usually like to show this uh, diagram anytime I'm talking about beaches. It's a, a good one to go over. It's uh, how a beach works, the, the beach cycle. So if we think about it, um, if we have a nice, fairly calm day on Lake Huron, um, calm waves will start carrying sand gently onto the shore. And then wind might pick up and dry out that sand and start blowing that inland. And if there's nothing to stop that sand, like um, vegetation or sand fencing, that sand's just gonna keep on going and, and blow up into town. It's going to maybe pile in front of people's cottages, blow up the street, and then it's lost from the ecosystem altogether. And uh, it's a, a non-renewable resource. But if we do have something to stop that windblown sand, like a, a dune, for example, then um, when you have bigger storm waves coming in, higher water levels coming up like we're experiencing right now, that dune will act like a, a bank account really. And the lake will tap into that bank account and pull that sand back out into the water, pull it back into the lake. And often it'll form a sandbar. And that is kind of neat because sandbars can help to um, buffer the shoreline against storm waves. They can help to slow down any waves and actually act um, pr to protect the shore. So that's a, a really neat cycle overall. And, and then that whole cycle starts, um, starts all over again. And so if you disrupt any part of that cycle, it uh, stops working altogether properly. So what do we need for a healthy dune? Well, first of all, we need a good supply of sand coming in. So that's why um, there are different types of beaches. Some are very high energy beaches, some are lower energy. Uh, some are what we call a relic beach where we don't have a lot of new sand coming in. It's uh, 
sand that has been there for a long, long time, like um, an example of a relic beach would be Port Elgin's main beach. So we don't have a lot of new sand moving in there, uh, but then a more high energy dynamic beach might be, for example, um, the uh, beaches in Southampton. So we have a lot more sand coming in. So to get a, a healthy dune going, you do need that supply of sand. So really uh, how successful your restoration project is going to be is going to depend on the way that sand is moving already in that ecosystem. So some restoration projects will, will just be more successful than others and it's not necessarily anything that you've done in particular to make it more or less successful. Um, and the other thing you need, of course, is uh, the wind and water and wave action to bring this sand onto the shore. And uh, then, as I mentioned, you need some type of obstacle to trap this sand as it's being uh, moved onto the shore. So your vegetation or sand fencing. And uh, if you take a look at this uh, picture I have, um, you can see at the, the bottom of the picture closest to the water, you can see that the sand looks very coarse there. And you can see all the nice light fluffy fine grain sand has blown further up and got caught in that uh, dune grass there. So next time you're on the beach, take a look and look at, at what type of sand you're seeing. Is it coarse? Is it nice and fluffy? And where is that nice fluffy sand sitting? And I think you'll notice that a lot of times it's sitting amongst um, dune vegetation or like dune grass. So without that, uh, that dune grass, our beaches will eventually degrade over time and become very coarse. Vegetation provides uh, other roles as well on our beaches. It uh, helps to slow surface runoff. So it uh, can help to uh, reduce erosion by stabilizing the soil and uh, it can absorb water and uh, filter out any contaminants then, any excess nutrients that are running across the land. It can help to filter that out before it flows right into our drinking water source and our, uh, the places we like to swim. And uh, vegetation, of course, creates habitat for wildlife. So it uh, creates habitat for some really rare coastal species like shorebirds and turtles and different pollinator species. So your first target for uh, dune restoration is uh, dune protection and maintenance. So first of all, we want to allow the dune to develop and to grow naturally without too much disturbance. And uh, we're gonna use sand fencing to help trap sand in any uh, low areas. And we're going to plant uh, beach grass in, in, in these low areas. Um, or we can just look at uh, whether there's beach grass nearby that might um, spread into uh, the area that we want to restore. So one thing we want to look at then is so. Uh, where we want to install our sand fencing. Um, so if you're looking to purchase this, you'll want to call it snow fencing, but uh, us at the coastal center, we like to call it sand fencing. And uh, it helps to create a base where uh, dune vegetation can begin to grow. So it helps to slow um, onshore winds that uh, then will allow the sand to fall down on the um, downwind side of the fence. So what you want to do is uh, try to figure out where the prevailing, prevailing winds are coming from um, and you want to install your sand fencing perpendicular to the wind. And uh, the deposition zone should be around 8 meters or 26 feet behind your fence. So that's where the sand is going to fall and start to build up into a dune. And if you do have any existing dunes on your property, you should look at installing your sand fence around three or four meters or uh, 10 to 12 feet in front of the base of your existing dune. And uh, if you're purchasing sand fencing, it's usually sold in uh, 50 or 100 foot rolls, but uh, it sounds like a lot, but you can split it very easily using uh, wire cutters to, to fit uh, your needs. And uh, then you'll also need to purchase some uh, seven or eight foot metal T-posts, and these are used to anchor the fence and uh, you'll need a post pounder to pound these posts um, at least two to three feet into the sand. Uh, you wanna make sure that uh, your sand fencing will withstand any November storms. And you'll want to put the posts around uh, four to six feet apart to make sure that your fence is secure. 
And uh, then you can use a wire to attach the, the wooden fencing to the, um, the T-post. And you wanna make sure you put, um, you put the fence on the windward side of the post. So if the wind is blowing off of the lake, it'll push the fencing against your post then and uh, won't be pulling at the wires then. So it'll be a lot more secure this way. And i uh, just like to mention as well, make sure that you're using any um, necessary safety equipment for this. Um, so you'll definitely wanna be wearing a hard hat uh, safety glasses, gloves, and steel-toed boots for this. Unfortunately, I've seen quite a few injuries happen when uh, people are using a post pounder, so please be safe out there. And uh, keep an eye on it over time because your fence may end up um, becoming um, buried in the sand, so you may need to reposition it as uh, sand starts to accumulate, so it's useful to get a uh, post remover as well to help with uh, making adjustments as needed. And we do um, usually recommend installing the uh, fencing in the fall and then uh, removing it every spring until you no longer think that you need it anymore. So it's usually only necessary for the first uh, two or three years until the uh, dune vegetation is established. So when I, I should mention as well, um, I've often been asked whether like what type of um, snow fencing to purchase and we always recommend the uh, wooden kind. We, um, we have tried the, the plastic kind and it, it doesn't work very well and uh, it's not uh, very environmentally friendly either. So I've been talking uh, quite a lot about uh, dune vegetation and, and dune grass and uh, marum grass or American beach grass, it's also called, it's possibly the most successfully used species in uh, dune restoration along Lake Huron. There are other grasses, of course, um, that we can use like long-leaved reed grass or Great Lakes wheat grass. Um, these are also really important dune stabilizers, um, but we tend to use um, American beach grass or marum grass for our restoration projects. Uh, it can grow roots up to three meters long, which is pretty incredible. And this helps to uh, stabilize sand and prevent erosion. So um, the photo on your screen is uh, of some marum grass and you can see the, the crazy root system that uh, has been exposed there. And uh, it's very cost effective because we usually recommend transplanting it. Um, we've never really been able to purchase any uh, dune grass. We've never seen it anywhere to purchase and uh, transplanting works great. Uh, it should be harvested locally if you can because um, harvesting beach grass close to your own property helps to prevent the uh, transfer of disease and uh, different plant genetics, meaning it will have a better chance of survival overall. So we'll often um, ask uh, someone on a neighboring property if we can borrow a few of their plants and uh, or sometimes uh, for larger projects we've partnered with a municipality and asked if we can um, selectively harvest some beach grass from uh, their mature dunes. And uh, planting of beach grass should be done in the late fall. I did mention this earlier um, because the plants are going dormant at this time and uh, this is the best chance they have of survival. It can also be done in the spring, but uh, the survival rate will drop by about 25%. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you're gonna go to all the trouble of planting uh, dune grass, it's probably best to wait until the fall. And uh, if you are planting them, you want to plant them around uh, 30 centimeters or a foot apart in a irregular pattern. And this will help to slow the wind speeds and uh, prevent erosion and will also give it a more natural look. If you have installed uh, sand fencing, you'll want to start planting your um, beach grass a few feet behind your sand fencing, so uh, towards your um, house. And uh, dune grass will tend to fill in very nicely within uh, around two to three years, it'll start to fill in. And uh, hopefully that by that point, you won't need to be um, using the sand fencing anymore. Your next target for uh, restoring a beach ecosystem uh, would be to look at um, your access paths on the beach. So if you have a straight path uh, from your cottage straight down to the water's edge, uh, these paths become very prone to wind erosion. Uh, so the wind from the lake just blows straight up that path right towards your door 
and uh, it tends to cause blowouts on the dune. So what you want to do is uh, create a narrow pathway that has an S shape to it. So that'll help to slow down that wind. It'll help to build up your dune and uh, keep the sand on the beach where it belongs rather than piling up in front of your um, house or your uh, cottage. And uh, you could use um, like a decorative rope or strategic fencing if you want to try to keep people on your path and off of the dune. Unfortunately, dunes are very easily trampled and it only takes a few footsteps to damage a really fragile dune vegetation. Our next target is uh, understanding and maintaining our dune profile. So there are three um, major sections of a dune environment and a dune profile can be thought of as a cross section through um, the dune system that shows the change in height of the surface of the beach and dunes. So, um, and you'll be seeing different types of vegetation as you move from the uh, water's edge inland. So if you start at the water's edge and you move inland, you'll um, see plant succession happening. Closest to the water, um, you'll find the fore dune, and this is an active dune along the beach that does change naturally over time in response to the wind and the waves. And you'll find in this area uh, mainly dune grasses and uh, smaller herbaceous plants. And then if you walk inland away from the water, you'll find um, the dunes are becoming more stable as you move towards the back dune. And uh, here you'll find more trees and more shrub species that are able to establish themselves as a result of sand being deposited over time and the back dune being more sheltered from the wind and the waves. And a healthy dune system is going to be more resilient and adaptable to changes in the lake, like our long-term lake level changes. As these water levels are rising and falling as part of this natural cycle, the uh, grasses and the fore dune will tend to expand and erode in unison. And it's all part of that uh, large beach cycle that we, we did talk about earlier. We've been talking about invasive vegetation a lot and uh, it's definitely something to be aware of on uh, your beach dune environment as well. Um, probably the most important uh, invasive species that you should be looking for on your beach is Phragmites australis. So you can uh, very easily learn how to identify this plant and remove it um, by doing a quick search online. We have lots of information about this plant on our website. And uh, this one really tends to take over uh, beach and wetland ecosystems very quickly and uh, can hugely impact your property values. So uh, if you can catch it early, it's very easy to uh, keep under control. So that's uh, my recommendation for the one to learn the most about. But other uh, species you can look at um, and keep an eye out for are uh, sweet white clover. That's a really common one and you um, want to remove that one as uh, much as possible, um, spotted knapweed, and uh, colt's foot as well. And uh, if you want to learn more about uh, invasives, like I said, uh, we should uh, do a, a previous webinar on this topic and uh, yeah, check out our website for more information. So the materials you'll need for a, a beach restoration project um, are fairly simple and straightforward. You'll need your sand fencing and T-posts, of course, and uh, you'll need to harvest um, your dune grass plants and get those ready. Uh, we do recommend trying to harvest and plant the same day. They don't do very well if left out um, overnight. And you'll need some shovels and spades and uh, trowels, of course, and uh, some buckets maybe to, to move your dune grass around in. And uh, your safety equipment, of course, that's very important. Uh, the post pounder and post remover that I mentioned. Uh, you'll need some uh, wire. We uh, usually use 16 gauge wire and some wire cutters and a uh, step ladder, wheelbarrow, um, a camera, uh, measuring tape, and uh, maybe some dune plants identification books to help you figure out what's actually out there. I know this is a lot of information to take in and figure out. So um, one of the things that we always do when we're preparing for a dune restoration project is uh, to take lots of photos, uh, take some measurements, and then create a site plan. 
Now this doesn't have to be fancy or anything like that. You don't even have to get on your computer to, to do any fancy sketches, but um, information you'll want to include is uh, the location of your site, uh, the date that you're um, doing this site visit, uh, include all your before photos and uh, any uh, goal photos that you have to, uh, to use as a reference for your project and uh, take some measurements and figure out the approximate area that you're going to be restoring. Um, I usually make a list of the materials I need, um, a timeline for your work plan, and uh, then I've put an example of a sketch that I've done um, on the screen here that you can see. Uh, so things you might want to include in your sketch would be uh, the location and des uh, design for your beach access path. So again, looking at that nice S-shaped winding path um, and then the orange spot uh, lines on the drawing are the uh, spots that we wanted to install uh, sand fencing. And so we'd broken it up into four smaller sections to install the sand fencing. And uh, the little X's on the orange lines are where we were going to install the T-posts. And uh, then the, um, the location and number of plants that we wanted to plant. So, uh, behind our sand fencing on the screen, you'll see the little drawing of the uh, dune grass plants that we had uh, planned. And uh, you'll also want to maybe um, consider again uh, any follow up plans that you have for monitoring after you've done your restoration work. So this might sound a little bit daunting. Um, but uh, it does get easier once you start doing it. But uh, we do actually have a brand new program um, in the past few years that helps people who live along the shoreline to learn about their beach and uh, to start thinking about a plan for beach restoration. So we uh, do try to help people whenever we can to, to prepare for a beach restoration project. And uh, so we have this program called the Green Ribbon Champion Program. And uh, it's a stewardship and education program that uh, helps to empower our shoreline residents and provide them with advice, resources, and support they need uh, to help protect our uh, beautiful beach dune ecosystems. And uh, last year, we were able to run this program in the township of Huron Kinloss. And then uh, this year, we we're lucky to be able to expand the program to uh, the municipality of King Carden and the town of Saugeen Shores as well. And in the future, of course, we would love to expand this program to other areas. Um, we just have to be able to secure the funding to be able to do that. Uh, so this, um, this program is really great in that we can provide educational workshops and webinars like we're doing right now. And uh, we go out and we meet one-on-one -on -one with people who live along the shoreline and we do a beach assessment with them and provide them with educational resources and uh, help them come up with a, a restoration plan for the beach. And uh, then we do, um, during usual times, try to get large groups of people together, uh, working with community groups and volunteers and schools and actually help landowners to complete some of these restoration projects on their shoreline. So um, things are looking a little bit different this year, but uh, we are still planning to run the program and uh, we are hoping that we'll be able to do some smaller scale restoration events this fall with people um, in those municipalities. And then at the end of the uh, program, we reward the people who are um, working hard to, to try to protect our beach and dune ecosystems. So we actually um, give out these Green Ribbon Champion Awards. There's a gold, silver, and bronze level um, that we award to successful restoration projects. And uh, if you, so if you are living um, along the shoreline within Huron Kinloss, uh, King Carden, or Sogging Shores, and you are interested in participating in this program, it's completely free. Um, I'd love to arrange to come out and meet with you and uh, talk about your beach and do a beach assessment and all of our recommendations are completely optional. There's uh, no obligation to actually follow through with any of them, uh, but we'd love to come out and, and talk about um, doing some restoration work on your property and uh, the contact information is available uh, on our website, lakehuron.ca, or you can um, see it on our next slide here. Yeah, so um, at this point, I think we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, if we do have any questions, I don't see any that have uh, come through in the Q&A box, but I can give it a, a couple of minutes and, and see if any are coming through. Um, yeah, like I said, if you're um, 
interested in participating in a free uh, beach site visit um, and signing up for the Green Ribbon Champion program, you can uh, get in touch with me, Erin, at uh, our um, email address there on the screen, coastalcenter at lakehuron.ca. And uh, the phone number is there as well. And uh, oh, I see I do have a, a question that uh, a couple of questions have come in and uh, someone would like to know where can you buy dune grass. Um, so I have actually never seen any native uh, dune grass species um, available for purchase at any nurseries. I may be wrong and, I, and if anyone ever sees any available for purchase, I would love to know about it so I can share this information. But uh, yeah, like I, I mentioned earlier, the really the best thing you can do is try to um, transplant dune grass. So uh, looking at um, whether your neighbor has a nice healthy dune or uh, maybe the, the public beach in your area has a nice healthy dune and then getting permission to see if you can uh, remove some plants from there. So just remove, removing a few plants here and there so you're not damaging the, the healthy dune. Um, but it does tend to spread quite quickly and quite nicely. So that's really the best method. And uh, someone would like to know if we can come to Wasega Beach. And I would absolutely love to do that because Wasega Beach is beautiful. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we're a small but mighty organization. We don't really have the capacity for that right now uh, with the number of staff we have. But uh, I'm hoping to be able to expand our program to be even bigger in the future and uh, so we can um, expand our site visits beyond uh, the few mun municipalities that are currently uh, available. Let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, I see another couple of questions coming in. Uh, someone wants to know if there's any uh, special technique for successfully harvesting dune grass. Uh, not really, it's very easy to do. Um, I was a little bit scared of trying it the first time, but I, you just, um, you can get a nice spade or even a trowel and um, Kind of angle it in um, uh, just next to the plant and so you're trying to um, take as much of the root as possible so uh, getting your spade in on an angle and uh, kind of severing severing the root but getting as much of that root as possible and uh, then it should just pop right out fairly easily and uh, then I usually use a bucket or a, a wheelbarrow and try to take a little bit of the sand um, just in case you you know it's going to be sitting there for a few hours or something and uh, like I said it's best not to leave it uh, sitting overnight uh, it would be best to try to get it back in the ground uh, the same day if possible for the the best chance of survival and uh, let's see I've had quite a few questions come through I don't think I'll have time to to go through all of them but uh, thank you so much for for your interest in uh, in this uh, topic. So um, if I don't get to your question, by the way, please uh, just get in touch and uh, I'm happy to chat on the phone more about this or uh, you can always uh, drop us an email, uh, the email address on the screen. And uh, let's see, are there any uh, programs, municipal, provincial, um, private, that a property owner can apply to to get funding to pay for fencing or posts, et cetera? Um, that's a really good question. I, I don't know of any that um, any individuals, uh, property owners could necessarily apply to, um, but really the, um, the restoration work that I'm talking about doing is very cost effective. Uh, sand fencing is not very expensive. Um, the posts are, are not very expensive, like you're looking at maybe a few hundred dollars worth of uh, equipment overall. And uh, if you're able to source the dune grass locally, you don't even have to pay for any, um, any plants. So it is really cost effective and uh, can really end up saving you a lot of money in the long run. If you're uh, able to restore a healthy dune, it may end up uh, protecting your cottage in the long run. Um, so really, really cost effective, especially if you're comparing to um, putting in a hardened shoreline structure. And uh, so yeah, really right now, the only program I know of is our own, the, the Green Ribbon Champion program, where um, 
we are lucky to have some funding available for that and we will actually try to provide um, some materials to uh, participants as well. So um, it's a limited supply, but uh, we do try to provide uh, sand fencing and uh, a few things to any of our participating landowners. So that's another benefit of participating in the Green Ribbon Champion program. And let's see. What about building non-sandy areas? Someone wants to know about get, uh, trying to get uh, dunes going. So like I said, um, it really depends on the type of beach that you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with a low energy beach, um, like a relic beach, um, like in Port Elgin or even Sauble Beach, um, there might not be a lot of sand moving around that area, not a lot of sand coming out of the lake and, and coming onto the shore. So you might, you know, try to, to put in some sand fencing and, and try planting some dune grass. I don't think it would hurt to try that, but you might not have a lot of success in getting a dune to build and it might take a lot longer. Um, but then um, I talked about uh, like, uh, Southampton Beach being a more high energy beach. There's a lot of sand moving around um, the Southampton area. So that's uh, why we've got such uh, large, beautiful dunes um, in Southampton. So that's a lot more high energy. If you were to install sand fencing in that area, I think uh, you would have a lot of luck with building a dune uh, very quickly. So um, it, it's really hard. You, you just kind of <laughs> have to work with what you've got. So. I would say it would be worth a try for sure um, to see if you can get a dune going, um, but you just have to know that it, it might not be successful depending on what, uh, how much sand is, is moving around in that area of the lake. And I think that's about it. I think that's all I uh, really have time for today, unfortunately, but thank you again so much for your interest. And uh, like I said earlier, we are a registered charity. So if you have enjoyed this free webinar series this summer, um, we do always appreciate donations and uh, any donations made um, are tax deductible um, because we are a registered charity and uh, donations can be made at uh, lakehuron.ca on our website. And I'd like to say thank you again to our very generous sponsors, uh, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, Bruce Power, and TD Friends of the Environment Foundation for making our Coast Watchers program and our Green Ribbon Champion programs happen this year. These programs and uh, this webinar series would not be possible without the support um, of these organizations. So we really appreciate it. And if you've missed any episodes in the series, you can actually find all of them recorded at uh, lakehuron.ca slash videos. So uh, you can watch them there or on our YouTube channel. And uh, all of us at the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation, uh, hope you really enjoyed this series and uh, we hope you learned something. And uh, thank you again for taking the time to participate. Enjoy the rest of your day.